Good evening and welcome to Slam the Gavel, the show that tells it all regarding family court, other court issues, as well as CPS. I am your host, Marianne Petri. This episode of Slam the Gavel is sponsored by CPS Protect Consulting Services. A child protective services case is one of the most frightening experiences for any parent. Don't face it alone. Face it with confidence, with urgent assist by CPS Protect. You can have access to former CPS investigators to make sure you preserve your rights and protect your family. If you're facing CPS involvement and aren't sure where to turn, their child welfare consultants can help you. Visit cpsprotect.com forward slash subscribe and enter the coupon code slam the gavel for 60% off your first year of urgent assist. And this is available in all 50 states. I have another announcement. Bradley's mother, Narcus Golan, passed away in the fall of 2022. Bradley is autistic and needs structured routine and therapies he receives for his autism six days a week. However, Italy just entrusted Bradley to the social Italian social services. If he is rolled to go back to Italy, he will face the next three to four years in the Italian foster care system where he can't speak or understand the language. He will then be taken away from the only family he has ever known. And we have Judge Ann Donnelly to thank for this. Please call Governor Hochul at 518-474-8390. That's Governor Hochul, New York State, 518 518- Four seven four eight three nine zero to please keep Bradley here safe in these United States. Hashtag keep Bradley safe. One last announcement. Go to the site, please do your job.com. We need 2,500 more signatures to get a case reopened. That's please do your job.com. I have a brand new guest on. I'm happy to have Charlie McCready back or on the podcast. He's a parental alienation coach coach out from London area, United Kingdom. He provides coaching services for parents experiencing parental alienation, which is where another parent or carer is intentionally trying to damage the relationship with the parent and the child and can result in a parent having no contact with them. And parental alienation is counterintuitive. It's poorly understood and it is traumatic for both the child and the parent that are being alienated. I welcome you to the podcast, Charlie McCready, all the way from the UK. And how did how did you get involved in this? What is your story? Well, first of all, thank, thank you very much for having me here today, Marianne. I really appreciate the, the invitation onto this amazing show. And um, yeah, so my my story really, it, I, I'm here because I've been through parental alienation personally. Um, I didn't, I, I think like many parents, I didn't actually understand what I was going through mm-hmm. at the point in time I was experiencing this. And with hindsight, I can point to a period of about 10 years of what I call pre-alienation. So my ex was creating the foundations, undermining me as a parent, damaging relationships with my two daughters. And when it got to the point in time that our own uh, partnership marriage was breaking down and we ended up splitting, that that was the moment that she turned, my ex turned to kind of full alienation mode, as I would call it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I went through a period of about five years of limited and no contact between my two daughters I'm delighted to say that I got through that period. I've now restored relationships with both of them. So they were 16 and 14 when this started. They're now 29 and 31 next month. Um, and we're in we're in a good space, but there are still the scars. And I decided about just over three years ago that actually what I wanted to do most with the next phase of my life is just dedicate myself to being a parental alienation coach to help all the parents out there who are going through this experience to understand it better, uh, to be able to move through it far more effectively and to really be able to help themselves and their kids through the trauma that that we kind of know as parental alienation. A lot of what you said is so very true that's happening to so many parents you don't see the alienation coming because it's so insidious yeah it's it's and also because it's still not recognized as a kind of pathology by the various um you know it's not in the dsm-5 for instance the united nations don't recognize it uh 
a massive problem that we have is that the the lack of education and understanding and it's not just for the parents who are experience, experiencing this but it's the professional community who have the responsibility for protecting children and it's it's quite shocking really to to think that social workers the social services the lawyers psychiatrists therapists judges the vast majority of, of these professionals are not educated and equipped to provide the level of protection that, that we really need because if they were we wouldn't one we wouldn't be in this mess but also they would be in a position that they would be able to help us to identify the signs of alienation quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And as it, as it currently stands, we as parents stumble across the term parental alienation rather than knowing what it is. And then we start going out trying to seek help from various you know, professionals or coaches, various literary sources to try and understand what we're going through. And I think one of the big things that all of us who've been through, not all of us, but several of us in this space are trying to increase that level of awareness so that people know what actions they can take. They know where they can go to go and get help. And ideally, but it will take much longer to actually fix the system so, so that there is the appropriate level of education with the professionals so they can do their jobs properly. I think with the professionals, I think they are a big part of the problem. Uh, from what I have found, uh, what a parent will do is they'll set up family counseling, right? And they won't include the other parent. Somehow the counselor doesn't pick up on that. The counselor doesn't pick up the phone and call that other parent and say, hey, you know, it's six o'clock. Where are you? And that parent, I'm sure, would say, I don't know anything about this because they're always the last to know. Yes. Well, the, the, I mean, the alienator's plan is basically to exclude you from your child's life as, as much as possible. Um, and, and for the listeners who might be less familiar with parental alienation, it might be worthwhile just spending a moment on kind of what typically goes on. So the, the, the people who are prone to be alien, parental alienators are individuals who in my experience have been through past trauma themselves mm -hmm. i don't think that an alienator is born i don't think and in fact most of them we use the term narcissist very loosely but very often a lot of these people have very narcissistic tendencies and somewhere in their lives they have suffered a trauma which they brought with them into their adult lives so they have tendencies to be quite childlike they and not really parenting in the sense of making sure that your children are being fed and doing their homework and wearing clean clothes and being washed and getting to the school on time and all that sort of stuff. They tend to be more of a friend to your kid because they're very focused on themselves. But they also tend to be quite controlling, coercive, manipulative. And what's really happening is they're protecting themselves from the outside world because they don't want to repeat this trauma from the past. So you will find yourself, and it's amazing how similar the alienators are, but if you find yourself in a relationship where the other parent is intentionally damaging your relationship with your kid, then you might well be facing alienation. And also just to make a point between estrangement and alienation, they are two different things. Alienation is the unnatural damaging of a relationship that is being done by one parent against another parent. And it's completely unnatural for a child not to want to have a relationship with their parent, even if they are mentally, physically, and sexually abused by a parent, they still want to have a relationship with them. So the fact that one parent can discourage that child from having a relationship with a naturally loving other parent shows the, ex the extent of their power and the damage that they're doing to your relationship with your kid. But just to, to get to estrangement, estrangement is something completely different. Estrangement is where you um, have got a strained or difficult relationship with your kid, and it's your actions that are pushing your child away rather than the actions of the alienator. 
And people tend to intermingle those those two, they interchange those two expressions, but they mean completely different things. Don't don't you think alienation can turn into estrangement? Yes. So um one one of the one of the areas that there's, there's, there's so many bear traps, as I call them, with alienation. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, one of those is parents who are being alienated and find themselves having restricted or very limited contact with their kids. Their kids have now got a distorted view of that person. They might be becoming disrespectful with you. They might be angry with you. And you know, as the target parent, you know that the the alienator is creating this narrative about you. They're trying to, to influence the child. And the temptation, and a lot of us get stuck with it, stuck doing this, is we then use our time with our children trying to persuade them of the other side of the story, which is, you know, well, I'm not the bad person. They're the bad person. Mm. And very often what happens is because we have less time with our kids in most cases, even if you have 50-50, your kid is now caught in this position where they've got both parents saying something very negative all the time. What tends to happen with kids is because alienation is a conflict-based relationship, it's a fear-based relationship, and the alienators are basically saying to the kid, you have to make a choice between me or mum or me and dad. And the kid knows that the parent who's forcing them to make that choice is going to punish them in some way, psychologically, maybe even physically, if they don't appease that parent. So it, it's it's a fear-based relationship that encourages the kid to align with the alienator. And it's counterintuitive that you align with the person who's going to do you the most damage and who's going to make your life the most difficult because they're afraid that that, that person might cut them out and also is going to do exactly that. They are going to make their life as difficult as possible. Mm-hmm. So they end up appeasing that person and cutting us out. So they know that we as the target parent, we tend to be empathetic. We tend to be kind. We tend to be open hearted. They know that we're never going to close the door on them. And so it's easier to push us away as a nice person mm-hmm. than it is to push the alienator away. Right, because our love is unconditional. And I feel yeah. like that's taken advantage of, but this is what happens. Absolutely. And and we're put in a very difficult situation because when we try to defend ourselves to our children, this is where we can estrange ourselves because the children are now aligning with the alienator. And when we defend ourselves, we're making the time spent with us uncomfortable because now we're becoming as bad as the alienator Mm -hmm. saying bad things about the other parent, trying to defend ourselves. And it's very confusing for, for our children. So we end up estranging them because we're pushing them away because we're trying to correct the situation. So it's a bit like having one arm tied behind your back in a boxing match. Mm -hmm. So you want to defend yourself but when you do, you push your kid away. It's I say it's it's very counterintuitive. Well, the target parent is constantly walking on eggshells when they do have their child. And then if they if the parent is in a family court situation, the you know, they'll have a visit with their their child, but the child, even even at the age of 12, 13, 14, this kid knows your case better than you do. <laughs> and, you know, uh, they'll say things and then you feel you have to rebuttal <laughs> because mm-hmm. you have to tell them the truth. No, that's not what happened. You know. <laughs> So th- this is this is the catch twenty two, and you you've just covered some really good points, Marianne, around walking on eggshells. So when when we as the target parent are in the relationship with the alienator, we become what I call the regulator. Mm-hmm. We are basically the people who try to keep the peace and regulate the mood of the alienating person who tends to be volatile 
you know, they get easily triggered. And so we, we become the peacemaker in that household, often at the expense of our own personal benefit, you know, our time. Uh, we have to give of ourselves emotionally and physically in order to, to keep the, um, the alienator on an even keel. As we step out of that relationship with the alienator, our kids step into it. They become the regulators in that household. And what, what also happens at that point in time, there's an expression called parentification or adultification. Mm -hmm. And this links in exactly with what you're talking about. So, and it, it's very often the oldest child. It's not always the oldest, but very often it's the oldest. Sometimes it's the most amenable child. In other occasions, it might be the child who got on best with us. But the, the alienators will quite often focus on one of them and they become their new confidant. They become, a, you know, basically your child replaces you. And that child is uh, treated like an adult. They are empowered as an adult. They feel entitled as, a, as an adult. But the alienator also shares a large amount of material, exactly as you're saying, which is completely inappropriate. So they share, you know, in they share information about your divorce. They share information about custody arrangements. They share information about financial arrangements. But of course, they will only share the things that cast you in a bad light. They're not going to share anything. It's very selective. They will share the things that, that serve their purposes to reinforce the fact that you're a bad person. Mm -hmm. And now you've got a child whose relationship with adults has changed because it's not just the alienating parent to the child the child is being encouraged to be an adult and they're being told very often you can make choices you know you can decide what you want to do you don't have to do what mom says or you don't need to do what dad says and it changed their relationship with all adults so the first person it changed their relationship with is you as the target parent because you now have a child who believes they're an adult so they no longer respect you for you being a parent they see you in a bad light so they no longer respect you for being a good parent and a loving parent and they feel empowered and entitled so they no longer feel the need to do what you suggest you know if if you so your your parent child relationship starts breaking down just as a result of of this parentification process and and you can you can see it in you can see it happening with your kids. And so when you get the angry kid turning up at your house, a lot of this is confusion and discomfort on the part of your child. And I encourage uh, I encourage every parent to look first of all understand what alienation is actually doing and what experience your child is really having, because. Only then can you start to understand how you can help them. So if, if you have more than one child, you might, let's hope you still have contact with them. If they come along to your house, they will be acting differently according to the experience that each of them is having with the alienator. So one of them might be a lot more alienated than the others. Um, but you have to look at what is the experience each child is having if they are being angry with you, why are they being angry with you? Um, you have to look beyond their the behaviors that they're demonstrating to see ultimately they still need you to be a parent for them. And, and sometimes you can't you can't be a normal parent. You just have to be a supportive, empathetic parent mm -hmm. and be very calm with them. But but one of the golden rules is you can't talk about alienation. Right. But I have, oh, go ahead. No, I can say that that bit really sucks because, as you say, when you have all this stuff, all these these facts being presented to you about you know your court case or your financial case, yeah. and you're and you want to fire back, you have to be really careful how you do that because what you're listening to is really the voice of the alienator, and you don't want to drag your your child further into that discussion. You want to take them out of that discussion. You know, there's times when you are you a parent has their back up against the wall with that. 
-hmm. whereas there was a situation where um, the alienator's wife who worked in the courthouse (laughs) said something to a parent that was, I know a lot of people in the courthouse and I'm friends with all the judges. So what the mother did was she reported this to that woman's boss. And then when this mother went to pick up her kids on that weekend, the one of the older kids said, you know, you reported her and now we might lose our house. So the mother responded, but that's what they're trying to do to us. Mm-hmm. So is that wrong to point out reality at times? I, I think you have to tread very carefully because the, the kids have been given a, a narrative that they probably believe. And I, th- I think there are times when, when you, you could and should hit back and say, yeah, but actually, you know, that's what they're trying to do to us. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think you should hide from such statements, but generally you should avoid the subject. You know, if, if, if they're talking about something more minor, you know, oh, mom, dad says you're spending lots of money or dad says you're being inappropriate with money. You know, you can tackle that in in, car- in calm way. Say, well, you know, you, you know that dad and me, we don't agree. We, we don't see eye to eye. We have different views. We have different perspectives. You know, I he's he's saying one thing. That's his view. The reality is, you know, maybe I see things differently and I think I'm spending money, you know, in, in a in an appropriate way and trying but I would say try and give examples where you can that are not related to you and your personal experience mm-hmm. so if, if you can talk about how uh, a reasonable parent might act and what a reasonable parent might do and how that reasonable parent might spend money and kind of align yourself with the reasonable parent you're talking about rather than you because it it takes the emotion out of it for your kid and try not to criticize the other person because when you when you do your kid will get defensive Mm -hmm. it also depends on the age of the kid this mother told me that the the kid that told her this was 16 so sometimes they're a lot younger sometimes you get six-year-olds coming up with this stuff yeah and if it was a six-year-old i don't think that mother would have fired back and yeah, so, yeah. You know, because at that age they're not going to comprehend all this you know mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. um it, it depends you know on the age and their maturity level yeah. of how you can respond and i think the, the parent has to also kind of feel their way through that and it also depends a lot upon how how alienated the child is so we we, we use kind of quite a simple scale of uh, mild alienation is the child is having some pressure put on them by the other parent, but it's more a case of the other parent. It's a short term thing. They're angry with you because you're getting divorced or they're angry with you because you've won a court case. And it, it's a it's a passing phase and it creates some unrest. But very often those sorts of parents are open to being contacted or open to being asked by attorneys not to act in certain ways. And those are children you can have conversations with because it's it's um, it's easier for the child. They're in less of a conflict situation. Mm-hmm. The severely alienated children is where you have no contact with them at all. So you're not going to have a conversation with them about mm-hmm. finances or anything else. And the um, the children who are sort of me- moderately uh, moderate to kind of moving towards that severe space those are children that can be quite difficult to have that conversation with because if the more severely alienated they are but still having contact with you Mm -hmm. the more they have this idea in their head about who you are and it's very difficult for you to correct them and when you do try to correct them you put them in a very difficult position because they're i'm going to go back to that fear-based relationship with the alienator Mm -hmm they are being angry with you because that is something that makes them feel more comfortable being with you physically. They know because you physically being, so when your child is being alienated in that way, 
the time they spend with you is uncomfortable for them because they know that it's causing irritation for the alienator. Mm -hmm. And if you're now having a conversation about, you know, whatever's happening in the law court, in, in your legal case, and you're defending yourself, you're now attacking the person that the child is trying to defend because they're afraid of them. And this is why you should not talk generally about alienation to your kids, because they are terrified that if they say anything that seems like they're siding with you, that's going to get them into trouble with the alienating parent. Right. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to link that in with a, a lot of parents, uh, some of the parents who who are more severely alienated will find that, you know, say they've got either no contact with their kids or they do have contact, but the kids are currently in the alienator's home. If they text their kids, their kids won't respond. And what's going on here is that when you text a child who's in the company or in the home of an alienator, they've now received a communication from the person they're not supposed to have contact with being you. And that makes them scared. And then, and even receiving that is disloyalty towards the alienator. So it, it's, again, that's going to make them, that's going to be scary for them. If they respond to you, they're being doubly disloyal to the alienator. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time the kids won't respond, but we, we know from a lot of alienated kids who've been interviewed later on in their life that they really appreciated getting those text messages from, you know, the target parent, the alienated parent, because they wanted a relationship deep down. They want a relationship with both parents. And it's just, it's like they've not been given permission to have a relationship with the alienated parent, but they want it. And so they, they like getting those texts because it says, I'm still there for you. I still love you. Never say you miss them, by the way, because that right. guilt trips them, Right. <laughs> but right. tell them you love them. Um, but yeah, so if, if the the parents who stop sending texts because they don't get the replies, uh, that's one of the things that the alienated kids have said later on, said, oh, I really felt sad at the point that my mom or my dad stopped texting me. And, and it's only because we'd given up because we didn't realize that even though they weren't responding, they were, they still, they still valued getting that communication from us. Or they had a judge's order with no contact. Very, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And you want to be careful about the no contact orders because if you breach them, the alienators will come after you oh, yeah. hard. Yeah, they breach orders all the time and seem to get away with it. Precisely well said. Uh, in fact, in a court case, the child who was, we'll say, 14, 15, Snapchatted the parent saying, mm -hmm. I love you. And I, and, you know, people don't understand, you know, like older people like us don't understand how this works is Snapchat. I still don't, I don't get it. And what the parent did was saw that message and it disappeared within three seconds. So mm -hmm. the parent tried, responded back, I love you or whatever. And they use that in court against the parent mm. because of the no contact. Mm. So the parent said, well, my child reached out to me and I felt I had to respond, yeah. which worked. Yeah. But, but these alienators will grasp at anything to nail that target parent to get them out of their ch children's lives. Yeah. I think I think people have to, it's important to understand the alienator hates us. They really hate us with a passion. But it's also important for us to understand that it's not about us as the target parent. The alienators are consumed with themselves. They are consumed with their own issues. They are obsessed with the fact that the world is against them. And they're constantly trying to protect themselves, which is why they're so controlling, manipulative, coercive, bullying, triggered so easily. It's And it's all to do with their past traumas. So they, they meet us. We're always nice, kind people. 
they end up in a relationship with us. They eventually show their true colors to us, having normally gone through a period of pre-alienation first, then we kind of hit full alienation. Um, and But at the point in time that we no longer serve a purpose for them, they become very, they really shift in terms of their relationships with us. And then normally ahead of us in terms of the actions that they take. And this, this is, we as target parents find ourselves in a reactive state for the vast majority of the time until we realize we need to get ahead of the game, which I'll come back to in one second. So the alienators are normally the people in, I would say the majority of cases who are deciding that they've had enough of the relationship with us. Even if we end the relationship, it's normally because they've made it so impossible for us that we can't have a relationship with them anymore. And sometimes they like us to end the relationship because it serves their purposes. They can be the victim, but they're often planning the fact that this, okay, this relationship is going to come to an end. So I'll start the pre-alienation on the kids. I'll start working on the friends. I'll start building support. I'll start working on family, my family, your family. I'm going to work on everybody. And then when full alienation starts, that's when the whole smear campaign, you know, they're, they're mm -hmm. out of the starting blocks well before we are. And also because we're nice people, it doesn't even dawn on us that we need to go out and start countering all these negative things that are being told, all these lies mm -hmm. that are being told to people about us. So by the time we're even aware of this, the damage has been done. Certainly with, you know, a lot of our families have been told that we're such a bad person and they believe us in some instances. Oh. A lot of our friends suddenly see us in this completely different light. So we're ostracized. Uh, it's particularly difficult for mums because for, for, for dads, there's this kind of stereotypical image that society has that, that dads are bad parents anyway. Obviously not true. Some are, so, you know, a lot aren't. But for mums who are seen by society as being the good parent, if they suddenly don't have their kids in their lives, it's like society turns on you and says, what did you do wrong? You know, you must be a really bad parent. But it's, it's not you. It is the alienator. And you just happened to be the person that was in that relationship with them. Whomever was in that relationship with them would be sitting where you and I are right now. It's not us. And when I say getting ahead of the alienators, we, for most of our time, we're in this kind of reactive state of, oh my God, they've done this. Oh my God, they've done that. Oh my God, they've done something else. And we're constantly playing catch up and trying to repair the damage that they've done. But, but the alienators, they're all remarkably similar. It's like they've got a book called Alienation 101 and they all read it and they all do the same stuff. I mean, it's remarkably similar. Well, guess what? We've got a copy of that book as well. And I would encourage parents to get to understand about uh, alienators because then you can start preempting what they're going to do because they're very predictable, you know? So if you've got um, a special day coming up and we were going to come, come on this, onto this as well, uh, you know that the alienators are going to want to spend time with that kid on that special day. And you need to make a decision as to how you're going to handle that. So for instance, if it's, if it's a birthday, alienators will want to be with your child on your birthday because if they don't, they feel, you know, you're, you're playing to their emotional insecurities and that past trauma. Um, you have to decide if you're going to trigger them by fighting for that birthday or not. And I'll just stay with triggers for one second. Alienators get massively triggered by court cases. They get triggered by money. They get triggered by anything to do with custody. They get triggered by you having a relationship with somebody new. They get triggered by you having a good relationship with your kids. If you trigger your alienators on any of those things, their responses, they turn up the uh, degree to which they're trying to alienate your kids. So you have to start thinking, right, if I'm, this is how you kind of say you get ahead of the alienators. 
and, and I'm just using the birthday as an example, you can actually decide, okay, I'm going to give them that birthday. I'm not going to fight them on that birthday because it's going to damage the relationship with my kid. Mm -hmm. But what I am going to do is I'm going to celebrate on another day with my child. And I'm, I'm just going to give that, I'm going to, I'm not going to have that fight because I'm going to lose. My child is going to lose. And the alienator is going to make this, this situation even worse for a period of time. Mm -hmm. So I know they're going to do it. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to have that fight. And equally, you have to be really careful about if you're going to take them back to court, mm -hmm. because sometimes you'll want to take your child, your, your, the alienator to court in order to enforce a breach or get more time with your kid. But depending on your likelihood of winning, you need to assess whether or not this is actually going to end up doing more damage to your relationship with your kid. Even if you win, mm -hmm. they're going the whole period of time that you're going through that court case, they're ramping up the alienation. If they lose, they're going to ramp up the alienation. The fact that you took them to court, they're going to ramp up the alienation. So you 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 also need to be thinking, again, getting ahead of the alienators, how how is my child going to be behaving during this period of time? What do I need to do for my, my son or my daughter? Because you know that the alienator is going to increase the pressure on them. There's a, there's a lot, there's a lot for parents to kind of have to focus on when they, when they're dealing with the complexities of alienation. Yeah. I've talked to a couple moms and dads that have just stepped back because they know that, um, trying to send a gift or a card it just makes the household for the child even worse the, mm. the child gets punished so they had figured that they were just going to step back and just observe at a distance because it was just making it worse for the child and that's so sad I t yeah i see so th th this happens a, a lot of the time again it's it's the catch-22 scenario Generally speaking, I encourage parents, even when things are difficult and strained, as much as possible to retain contact with the child. Because if you lose contact, then you're completely reliant upon the child kind of re-engaging with you at some point in time. If you've got some ongoing contact, especially when the child gets a bit older, and when I say older, I'm talking about very often when they leave home or they go to college, or they go to a university, and they're out of the physical environment of the alienator, that's when we very often see a change in the child's appetite to kind of re-engage with the alienated parent. If they've already got a relationship with you, that process is much easier. If they have no relationship with you, it's really hard for the child often to kind of break out of, I, I refer to it as a cult. It's a bit like being in a cult. It's kind of really difficult for the kid to break out of being in that cult to, to re-engage with you. But the parents are in this, an alienated parent is in this catch-22 position, exactly as you describe it, that if you, um, if you fight for your child, the alienator will fight back. And they are, it's like alienators are dehumanized to some in some ways as part of the trauma that they faced in the past the way because they are they are insecure vulnerable people and i know people find that difficult to accept at first because they hate us and let's face it we don't like them and it's very difficult to see an alienator as basically being an insecure vulnerable child in an adult's body but that's who we're dealing with. And, and that's why they act in the way that they do. And they are very childlike. But as a child, if you try to, if a child is adamant they're going to get their way, they will do whatever in order to win. And that's what you're up against. So the alienator will do an enormous amount of damage to your child just in order to win. They don't care what they do. Right. We care. We care about the damage. And, and we end up in this horrendous situation, exactly as you described, where we have to back off in order to take the pressure off the kids. And when we back off, then the alienators come in and say, ah, your mum's abandoned you or your dad's abandoned you. And it's like, whatever you do, you, can't, you cannot win. And we have to be so selfless as, as parents. And I think 
any parent who has that much unconditional love for their child that they're able to to step back you know you guys deserve a medal you you some you deserve some form of recognition to say wow and i've been there i've been there personally where i recognize that my children were being put under so much pressure by their mom the only way i could i could take that pressure off was to step back and and not not demand so much time with them mm-hmm. and accept a lot less time with them accept a lot less contact with them and in fact with one of my daughters in um so as of my two daughters one of them went to university one of them was still left at home the alienation increased on the kid who was left at home she now had to deal with everything as opposed to it being split between two of them that made her alienation experience even worse and then the time that she was spending with me was becoming even more strained and i had to make a really difficult decision which was to say to her one one day at dinner um, i took her out and it was just impossible having any conversation with her at all and i said look we just need a holiday from each other so let's not let's just walk away from tonight let's not have contact for a period and let's just let things settle it was two years before we had contact again longest two years of my life but it, it enabled us to kind of start restoring a relationship after that period but you don't know when you're going to have those opportunities to re-engage with your kids mm-hmm. and that probably i'm conscious of i'm talking a lot not to give you an opportunity to ask that many questions but one of the key messages i have for every single parent is go and learn about alienation and how it works because it is counterintuitive and if you don't understand it you're going to fall into lots of bear traps you are going to estrange your kids unwittingly because you think you're doing the right thing for your kids. You're not in a lot of instances because it's it, it, it does not follow logic. So if you don't understand alienation, you can't really help your kids as much. And if you lose contact with your kids, a lot of people think, oh, I've lost contact with my kids. I'll tell you what, when I have contact with them again, then I'll go and learn about alienation big mistake you have to learn about it before you have contact so one of the one of the big no-nos when your kid reaches out to you we're we're like starved teenagers who are suddenly put into a food shop we go yeah yeah, gimme 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 you want to stuff your face and eat as much as possible of this amazing time you've got your with your kids and your emotional self says they've turned a corner i've been waiting for years to for this to happen hooray finally and your your kid has put their little toe into the water of of like engaging with you and your response is like this massive tsunami that just kind of pummels them into the beach Mm -hmm. with you know oh i told you about your dad being a bad person or i told you about your mom being a bad person yada 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 and it's all about you and your emotions and your frustrations and all the injustice that you faced and the poor kid is overwhelmed Mm -hmm. And you you can do that in you know such a short period of time. It's such a big mistake. Guess what? That kid who is uncomfortable at reaching out about reaching out to you, they're just going to go away. And you've that's a classic example of estrangement. You have done the damage to the relationship yourself because you didn't go off and learn about how this works. Well, that that's a very good point. Um, I know when all this started for me. Um, my attorney said he wants you completely out of his life and, yep. and she stood on the steps and she had this horrible look on her face. And I'm like, looking at her like, well, what does this mean? You know, but she didn't come out and say, okay, he's trying to alienate you. I need you to look these things up. I think the attorneys need to be more helpful and say, okay, this is what's going on. Start reading the, you know, some, some of these things. Look, look up Charlie McCready, look up at, you know, all these other people and learn about this. And I know, even though I didn't know what I was doing when, you know, my kids came over, I just didn't even talk about the other parent. I did not bad mouth. I did not 
do anything. I just try to make it happy like Disneyland Mm -hmm. because I only had them every other weekend. So, you know, Mm -hmm. and then I, then that parent who makes it happy like Disneyland then gets chastised in court for being the lax parent. (laughs) So you can't win. You can't, you can't win. Um, I'm going to talk about the three things in a moment that that parents really need to focus on, but uh, you've you've just touched upon boundaries, which again is something that's really really hard for for us as target parents to live with. So, the the alienating parents tend not to have boundaries. They they control, but they're controlling. They, they don't control things like what time your kids go to bed. They will let them stay on social media too long. They'll let them play video games too long. They'll let them be introduced to alcohol very early. They will basically, you know, they won't make sure they eat the right foods. They don't, it's like the wild west in a lot of their households. Then they come to our household where we're trying to be a responsible parent. And it's like good cop, bad cop. So where do the kids want to be? They want to be in the Wild West because they can do anything at the other parent's house. And this is going to sound crazy to some parents. I have come across a number of cases where children have successfully been alienated, in part estranged, over video games. So the good parent has said to the kids, no, you cannot play video games till three o'clock in the morning. So they've disconnected the internet or they've physically taken the game away from the kid. So the kid goes off to the other parent, the alienator, who says, yeah, sure, you can play till whenever. And if the kids are of an, you know, a certain age, 13, 14 or, or older, they pretty much move out of your property and they go and live with the other person. doesn't matter what the court orders or anything else says because there's the voice of the child's kicking in at that point. And you have, you have now estranged your kid and pass them into the hands of the alienator because your boundaries Mm -hmm. were the right boundaries but the alienator doesn't have any so i it sounds again it's counterintuitive i encourage parents to really have a look at their boundaries Mm -hmm. and say in a case of two evils which which one am i going to pick am i going to go against my own principles of what i think is the right thing to do in terms of being a parent and be relaxed with my boundaries or do I run the risk of my kids spending even more time in the other person's house really challenges us but but I was just going to say as well there there are three areas that every parent needs to focus on and if you can imagine them as like these are the, the core pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and there's lots of other pieces that sit all around here but the first one is understanding parental alienation understanding it from your kids perspective because parents tend to see it through their own experience as in the parents experience your kids are going through something completely different so you need to understand you know the pressure they're under how it's working you know you need to understand the conflicts the fears the choices the parentification their experience you can only help them if you know what their needs are. So that's the first area. The, the second area is you need to understand alienators. If you don't understand how alienators operate and the things that trigger them, you know where their past traumas are coming from, how are you going to start getting ahead of them? If you don't understand the game that they're playing, you are less able to reduce the damage that they're doing to your relationship with your kids. And then the third area is you as a parent, because we all come, I've talked about the alienators coming into alienation with their traumas. Guess what? We rock up with all of our baggage as well. And our our emotional journey is a bit like a, a, a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. so we're going through we all go through the same stuff we go through grief which is grief related to the time we've already lost with our kids the time we're losing today the time we anticipate losing in the future we also have a great sense of isolation because nobody else around us understands what we're going through and I, i i make the parallel to being a parent only a parent understands what having a child is like somebody who's not had a child 
is going through some theoretical experience. You know, it's like you do not understand the emotional connection of having a kid. Parental alienation is exactly the same. Unless you've actually had the emotional trauma that is associated with parental alienation, you do not understand it. And I think that's part of the problem. They're trying to train up judges, lawyers, therapists, counselors, all these people into something that is so emotionally traumatic. It's, you know, it's, it's hard. This is why people like me can really help parents because I know what you're going through. Mm -hmm. But we come into this, as I say, we come into this with all this baggage of our own. And these are our past traumas. So one of the reasons that we, most of us end up marrying narcissists is because we have, we're people pleasers, we are lacking in confidence in some areas. We're just too darn nice. Mm -hmm. And it's that's honest. not, a, it's not a good thing being too nice to people. It's, it's because our own sense of self-worth and value has been undermined in a lot of instances by our own parents and our own upbringing. So we don't like confrontation, for instance, you know, we don't ask too much of other people, but these past traumas that we have bubble up to the surface when we're experiencing alienation with the alienators and our kids. So the alienators, they know all of our triggers. They know all our buttons and they push them. And those buttons all revert, typically revert back to much earlier experiences that we've had. Lots of them go way back to our childhood. So you as a parent need to start learning what your triggers are, what are your buttons? So I'm just going to talk about another feeling, injustice. We all have this strong feeling of injustice, but guess what? That feeling of injustice is unique to you. Other people are having injustice, but your version of injustice will be based upon some specific experience you had way back when you were a kid, probably. And you brought that with you all the way to this point in time. And what's happening is when you're experiencing the injustice of this impossible situation, your kids are being hurt. The alienator is getting away with it all. The legal system, the psychiatrist, nobody's being able to help you. You just feel the sense of powerlessness in frustration, anxiety, stress. And, and it's pushing this button of some experience you've had way back. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of time people don't talk about this stuff. They, they don't say, okay, how do you, so I want every parent to heal. That's my third, my third point. You as a parent have to heal yourself because I use the example of two universes. There's the universe of you. There's the universe of your child and they are separate universes. When you're hurting you are less able to help your child. So I'm just going to give you an example of that. So if your child is spending time with you over a weekend and they have mentioned something about, you know, they've been at their dad's house and their dad has said something to the child that's going to wind you up or they've just enjoyed themselves and that's irritating in itself. If you get triggered, you're now focusing on you. You're no longer focusing on your child. So something about the injustice of what your child has just said will trigger you and it will trigger you every time. And now you're focusing on you because you're feeling hurt. And where you want to be focusing is on your kid. Because if as soon as you're focusing on you, you've lost concentration on my child is saying these things because they're hurting. They're feeling afraid. They need comfort. They need me to be calm. They need me to be the super parent. I've got to rise above all of this. I've got to be that loving, empathetic person. But you can't do that when you're focused on you and your pain. So if you if you really want to deal with, with alienation, you have to heal yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to know what your kid is going through, what is their experience. And you have to know what the alienators are doing that's impacting you it's impacting your kid and how it's impacting your relationship with your kid. And there's, there's like a million pieces that fit around those three simple core areas. But those are the, those are the really important areas for every parent, parent to focus on. 
they're very important. I've talked to parents and they're so distraught that, you know, the judge has taken away their kids and, um, or they'll see them every other weekend or once a month. And mm -hmm. I'll say, you've got to stay busy, find an old hobby or a cheap yeah. hobby and just focus on something kind of positive like that. Put yourself in that. Uh, for instance, I did a lot of paintings, you know, just to stay busy, which is also a trauma response as well as staying busy all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, you've, you've got to do something, not just sit there and just stare at the wall. I totally agree with you. So this this actually goes back to uh, the whole point about this emotional roller coaster. I call it an emotion, emotional roller coaster and Groundhog Day. So your alienating partner, ex, whoever puts you on the roller coaster by starting you having these experiences of grief, frustration, guilt, isolation, powerlessness, anxiety, they start you on that ride. Now, this is this is where it gets crazy. They kind of then leave you on that ride. You become the person self-perpetuating that experience. And this links in to what you're saying about keeping busy because you're and this is kind of where a bit of psychology comes in. Your subconscious will work with whatever you give it to work with. So if you're focusing on grief, frustration, anxiety, worry, anxiety, you know, sorry, worry, all these other things, that is what you're asking your subconscious to work on. And it does. So it goes, Marianne, you asked me to work on grief. So I'll do that for you. And it comes back a couple of hours later, you know, you'll be trying to do, you know, write a report or prepare a meal or you're traveling to work or whatever it is. And you suddenly got ideas of guilt and frustration again. And that that is your um, your subconscious saying, oh, I thought about it and this is the answer. So you're now thinking about it a second time. And guess what? You now give it to your subconscious once more. So your subconscious goes, oh, Marianne still wants me to think about you know, anxiety, grief, worry, so I will. And so you just get caught in this loop. And the reason, exactly as you say, the reason to keep busy is your mind can't concentrate on multiple things at the same time. So if you do yoga, you just go, if you go and spend 30 minutes doing yoga, your body, your mind is focused so much on the practice of doing yoga, you forget about alienation. If you do a breathing exercise for a few minutes, again, the same thing happens. You can forget about alienation for a period of time. But to, to heal, you need to, first of all, give yourself permission to get off the roller coaster. You have to recognize you're on the roller coaster in Groundhog Day because you're just going around and around and around and around. So it's like, okay, I'm, I've got all these, these triggers, these emotions. You have to identify where these things are coming from. Mm -hmm. Because every time you get triggered, you're going way back in the past. In fact, you're living your life by being in the past. It's a bit like living your life by looking through the rear. You wouldn't drive your car by looking in the rear view mirror. But this is how you live your life with alienation. Right. Because you're constantly being triggered by stuff, which is reminding you of stuff in the past, which makes you feel bad. And you're back on that roller coaster again. So you need you need to connect with what are, you know, injustice. Where is that injustice coming from? You, you need to do things in inner child work and various other tools and techniques that you, you can do, but connect with, understand where that, that sense of injustice is coming from and then stop focusing on it. Mm -hmm. And so the long-term healing comes from shutting down the focus on the things that no longer serve you, but that creates a void and your mind doesn't like a void. And so if you create a void, it'll just go back to the old stuff that you're trying to get rid of. You have to put something new in there. So which is your hobbies or it might be having a sport or mm -hmm. it might be projects like most people are going through a lot of change when, you know, alienation typically is associated with, you know, divorce, often high conflict divorce. So you're going to be in a new house. You might be moving to a new area. You might be setting up, you know, uh, buying new cars. There's, there's a lot going on. You have to actually create a whole new life for yourself. Mm -hmm. nurture the future where you want to go, not all these negative limiting beliefs that are holding you back and causing you all this pain in this thing that 
in the way that you experience alienation. And when you start healing yourself, you will find that if you're nurturing the future, you're focused on where you're going. And when you're with that, when you're with your kid and they trigger you because you're consciously thinking, you go, oh, no, 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 I don't get triggered by that stuff anymore. I'm focusing on you. So you focus on your kids and you talk to them about the future. You're suddenly not having a conversation about your dad's a bad person and he shouldn't be telling you about financial information. You're suddenly having a conversation about how do you want to paint your bedroom? Mm -hmm. Where are we going to go this summer? You know, what are, you know, what's the good stuff that we're going to be doing going forwards as opposed to constantly looking backwards? Mm -hmm. Does yeah. that, does that make sense? Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. You know, when, when you get your kids on the weekends, uh, you know, just, you know, what movie do you want to go to see? You know, where do you want to go? Just, you know, make it a positive experience for them and not, you know, like not talk about anything in regards to the other parent or other mm -hmm. things like that. Um, what I also wanted to bring up was that when you talk to your friends or if you have family, mm -hmm. Only talk about, you know, um, we'll say these court experiences for, you know, limit it to like 10 minutes and then drop it. Like um, with my current spouse, um, lucky for him, he worked out of town through this whole escapade. Um, but, you know, he'd call me every night and he said, OK, what happened in there now? And so we'd only talk for 10 minutes. And I say, how's your day and what's the weather like over there and <laughs> things like that? Because you don't want to damage the relationships that you have as well. Yeah. I, and I, I guess there's, there's, there's a few different kind of angles to that. There's, you don't want to bore your friends by something that is very close to your heart. And it can become obsessive for us because we're thinking about it all the time. And especially in the, in the earlier stages of alienation, it's just consuming, you know, it just takes over our lives. That's, that can be the hardest time to do that self-healing, but it's also the best time to start. I mean, you want to start self-healing as early as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, just very quickly on the self-healing, and I'll come back to the friends. Back to those universes, a lot of parents don't naturally focus on themselves because they think I'm being selfish if I focus on myself. I should put all of my attention on my kids. And what they don't realize is that you can't really help your kids as effectively until you're healed, as I was saying before. So we also have this crazy idea. It's like a trauma bonding that unless we show the kids that we are sad and depressed and upset, that they won't understand that we miss them, that we love them, that we're thinking of them. So we present these you know, really quite depressed versions of ourselves, if we're not careful, to our kids. And that makes us really unattractive people to be with. And what they want to see is confident, assertive, you know, loving, caring, sympathetic. When I say assertive, in, in a positive way, not in a controlling way, but they want to see the best version of you possible. We feel uncomfortable with that because it's counterintuitive because we think, oh, my God, if I'm getting on with my life and enjoying myself, which you should be doing absolutely, this is this is going to upset my kid. Actually, our kids so much prefer that, even if they demonstrate some negative behaviors at first, which they do. Actually, deep down, they really prefer us to be strong and happy. Mm -hmm. But with our with our friends, because we get so obsessed, we run the risk of just like talking to everybody about it all the time. And I agree with you don't or limit it. But also they have no idea what you're going through. Most of them, you're you're. You're fortunate in an unfortunate way, as in if you find somebody else has been through it, it's unfortunate that they've been through it as well. But it works well for both of you because you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But trying to educate your friends, don't. But really, it's I would not advise this to people because you they just won't get it. The people you do need to educate are your family. Because mm -hmm. You, this is another one of the bits that really sucks about alienation. If you went through a death, everybody understands death and bereavement. They know what they know what you're experiencing and they know how to help you. And so they, they all do the right things at the right time broadly. Alienation, they haven't got a clue. So they will do things that end up causing 
relationship damage between you and your kids. So say that your own parents, the children's grandparents, don't get to see their kids because the alienator has stopped them from seeing your family, which is what they typically do. Mm -hmm. So your grandparents are now going through their own trauma, the kids' grandparents are going through their own trauma of, of Greece, grief and you know isolation and anxiety and not seeing their grandchildren anymore. And naturally enough, they're angry about it. And when they have time from, from the grandchildren, with the best will in the world, they try to correct the behaviors of what's going on. So they'll turn around to our kids and say, I don't like what you're doing to your mum. I don't like what you're doing to your dad. And our kids blame us for that conversation. And then they say, well, I don't want to be at grandma's anymore. I don't want to be at grandpa's because they, they're, just, they're just supporting you. They're giving me a hard time. And they end up estranging your kids. And so you have to go and help. I say, unlike bereavement, where everybody rallies around you and supports you, this is the opposite. You are the center of the universe that radiates out to help everybody else. So it's another reason you have to be very strong and very healed because you're not just helping your kids, you're helping your friends. And most importantly, you're helping your family because mm -hmm. they're going through their trauma and you have to coach them through it. You have to coach your kids through it. And I use the word coach, not parent, because when you're, kids are being alienated especially when they get parentified and your relationship with your kids is changing and you're being disempowered you're you no longer have that authority that you had before mm -hmm. and so you move into being a coach rather than a parent and your your family needs to be in that space as well you can't just tell your kids what to do anymore you need to have some boundaries. You want to try and keep that parental connection as much as you can, and your kids will benefit from that. But the balance of time, the vast majority of time, you're going to be in coaching role. You know, I was talking to another parent. I promise I won't keep you too much longer. <laughs> but, it's, it's, it's a very big subject area. Well, like with families, you know, um, you know, like the alienated parents, siblings don't get it um no. at all and they'll they'll be talking about what a great time they're having with their kids and that's fine but they know you've been to court and they know you've had your kid taken away mm -hmm. and there's a disconnect there i they're like un unempathetic unsympathetic or yeah yeah so i it, think it, that's it's cruel yeah it, it's it's really interesting because uh, obviously, I speak to a lot of people about this, so I get to see kind of a, a wide variety of cases. But I see a, a, a pattern whereby the relationship that you have with your siblings pre-alienation is accentuated post-alienation. So what I mean by that is if you had a really good relationship with your siblings beforehand, they're really good and they're very helpful and supportive. If you had a slightly strained relationship with your siblings it tends to bring out the worst aspects in them rather than the best aspects. So I have seen lots of siblings turn against the target parent. I have got lots of, of clients that I work with whose own parents have turned against them because they've recognized what well, a couple of things. One, they some of them actually believe all the nonsense that they're told by the alienator. But also they recognize that they they see that the alienator kind of has control of the kids and that if they don't play ball with the alienator, they're going to lose the relationship with the kids. Mm. And it's just crazy because you think, hang, hang on, a minute, my family should be the people who rally around me. I, I, and you know, I can look at my own personal experience. My parents had no idea what I was going through and couldn't really engage. I had, you know, I had to help them. My older brother, again, didn't really get it. And my twin brother turned against me, mm. as did his wife. And it's like, I can't believe you're siding with uh. the person who's doing all this damage to me and my kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and it turned out, you know, my, my twin brother was jealous of me. And he had persuaded my wife that my successes in life were all due a fabricated story 
were all due to my mum having given me support because he couldn't explain how I'd done better than he had in life. And it was because I'd worked harder. Very simple. Not because anybody had helped me. But his own issues, his baggage were all coming to the fore. And he thought, ah, this is, you know, clearly Charlie's a bad person. And his ex has now identified this and raised it to the world and kind of leapt on it as a bandwagon to go, oh, yeah, he's a bad person. It's like, really? <laughs> you, okay. I can't believe you're doing this. And it was all about him in mm -hmm. the same way that my my ex and her narcissistic behaviors were all about her. It was all about him. And you, you'll see this. The more people you speak to, the more you'll see families turning on themselves. Yeah, it's terrible. Twisted. It's, it's terrible. so twisted. Yeah, yeah. And it's just another layer of this, this trauma that you have to deal with at a point in time that, you know, you really want everybody to be rallying around and, and, and supporting you. Mm -hmm. we, we, we have to become superhuman people to get through this experience. And I know, I know the pain that parents are going through while they're experiencing alienation. But if you, if you invest the time to heal yourself, you will actually be a better version of you coming out the other end of this. Mm -hmm. it's literally, this will make you or it'll break you. And but you have that choice. You decide if you're going to come at this better or worse. Don't give in to the alienators. Do, and if you let, if you come out the broken version, the alienators won. This is this is one of the biggest ways you can win this battle is you're in good shape. You survive. You're in this for the long term. You're there ready, you know, a, a super version of yourself ready to support your kids at the point in time that they're ready to have that relationship again. Mm -hmm. I got one last question for you. Then I promise sure. I'll let you go. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say to these people that say, well, parental alienation is just junk science? I have a very simple answer. Most, most of these people, I don't even engage in that conversation because they, I'm not going to, I, I'm not going to denigrate them because I think in their hearts, they're probably coming from what they think is a good space. But I would say that they're failing, they're, they're really failing to look at the facts and the evidence that are out there. And, and I tend to find that these are not people that you can actually have a conversation with and persuade them of the other side of the argument. I also have a pretty good idea of who these people are. So around, and, and this is happening around the world right now. Um, there are, there are movements who are trying to protect women from domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody should be exposed to domestic violence but this is this is the connection i keep seeing all the time um they are basically saying that uh, men who are the only perpetrators of domestic violence are using parental alienation as a mechanism to continue their campaign of violence against the women and the children and so are falsely accusing mothers of parental alienation mm -hmm. and they, they're providing, you know, there's quite a lot of kind of, uh, the, the great irony is they accuse parental alienators, people like me who advocate it, saying this is a real thing. They say it's a pseudoscience. The reality is they are dealing with the pseudoscience and they're not actually dealing with the reality of what's going on. They haven't done the research to say, okay, who are actually the perpetrators of domestic violence? Well, it's both men and women. Mm -hmm. Who are the victims of parental alienation? It's both men and women. And part of the part of the problem that we have is because it's not recognized by the psychologists and the psychological professions, nobody's spending the money on doing the research. And it's a catch-22 situation. If somebody was spending the money on the research, they would come up with the evidence to support the need to recognize it as being a real thing that is affecting tens of millions of people around the world. But because but because the research is not being done, we can't prove to the people who need to see the evidence that this is a real thing. So you've got these movements throwing the baby out with the bathwater mm -hmm. saying, because 
a and let's face it it's a probably a we don't know how big that population is but because of the people who are genuinely suffering from domestic violence and need to be protected they should not uh, dispense with the idea of parental alienation as being a real thing just because it suits their purposes to help protect women mm-hmm. don't don't your your i mean i don't know what the numbers are but it could well be that they're affecting even more women who are suffering parental alienation than those that they're trying to protect through the false accusations of parental alienation who are suffering domestic violence. I don't know what the numbers are, but, you know, it would be interesting to see the stats. Mm -hmm. But they're also, I find these are impossible people to speak to. Yeah, they are, definitely. Well, where can people reach you if they have any questions? So um, I'm on LinkedIn as Charlie McCready. I'm also on Facebook as Charlie McCready and Instagram. I have a group page on Facebook as well, which is Overcoming Parental Alienating Behaviors. Uh, And I've got a website, which is very easy. It's charliemccready.com. Great. I'll have that in the podcast notes. Um, fantastic. Yeah. So I do I do provide coaching services for parents. Um, I also have a program which is like a crash course on how you learn about those three core areas mm-hmm. um, over a space of a couple of months that, that just takes people through a structured way to understand the complexity of what you're you're dealing with. And I think that's the key to it all because it's very big. It's it's it is complicated, and what people need is some nice, simple a nice simple framework that says, okay, you need to learn this, you need to learn that, you need to learn this. This is how all the pieces fit together. This is how it is affecting you because everybody everybody's situation is unique, but it's also uniquely similar to everybody else. Definitely. And so. What, what I do with my coaching is I look at the array of of different experiences that people have and look at what's worked in particular situations and then marry up lots of different scenarios to your particular experience of parental alienation and say, okay, for a child of this age and with these sorts of uh, this sort of experience, these are the sorts of things that's worked in that's worked well in that situation. And equally, you know, this is the sort of alienator you're dealing with. And this is the sort of person you are and the sort of stuff that you're going to be going through. And so what what will help you specifically? Mm-hmm. And so that's the magic that I do is I marry all those things up together to help people basically to, to cut out a lot of the pain that you just don't need to be going through. That's excellent. People need that. Mm. And, yep. and having been having been there, I know what it's like. Mm-hmm. And I don't want anybody else to be going through it. Mm. Well, you provide an excellent service. And I'd like to have you back on. I'd love to come back on again. I'd I'd be very happy to. As you see, it's, it's like there's no end to this subject in many ways. Right, right. Well, um, hey, don't jump off. Slam the Gavel is a podcast to help the public understand what really goes on in these family courtrooms. I am your host, Marianne Petrie, author of Dismantling Family Court Corruption, Why Taking the Kids Was Not Enough, and Cry Out for Justice, Poems of Truth, and Raised by These Wolves, How Family and Federal Courts Are Failing Our Children. Please join me again here with Charlie McCready from the UK and other exciting guests. You can find me on Spotify, YouTube, Apple iTunes, Anchor FM, iHeartRadio, Uh, other platforms I don't know about. And feel free to donate to buy me a coffee to keep the podcast going. Thank you so much, Charlie. A pleasure. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you.